you know, I played at Leeds. I know the crowd are just amazing uh, for the home side, not for when you're playing for Chelsea. <laughs> but I tell you, that's a real no-no. Did you always get along with Howard Wilkinson? Mm. Um, I think Eric was certainly a player that wanted uh, an arm around his shoulder. He wanted to be made feel important. He wanted to be uh, the focus of the team and everyone would then play off it. Now, Wilco had no one like that and he is the best coach I've ever come across. Oh, he is. He is. I had two years joy with him. Obviously now we understand about mental health and, and things so much more uh, and football is the worst environment you know, for that in that we're all big macho guys and hiding everything. But um, um, i got to say, uh, Speedo was a, a wonderful guy on and off the pitch and I, I, I never come across better, simple as that. They'll be itching for anyone that says there might be a question mark to ram it down their throat because that's what I would be as a player. I can't wait to get out there and show them. Uh, they are training hard. Uh, I talked to one or two uh, during lockdown. Um, I know what training they're doing. Wow, my goodness, they've had one day off a week and that's it. Wow. They're active and they're ready to rumble. And, uh, and even they say, no one's going to be training like us. So then, obviously, after that, we had the move to uh, Leeds United. Um, now, just your first initial thoughts, Tony, when, when Leeds came in for you. Um, there were one or two other options that I had. Um, I was about to head off to Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia with England. That was um, uh, the plan that summer. I was uh, doing a, a tour with them, with the national side, for uh, a few weeks. And I decided to, to try and um, do my move when I got back. That was the thing, you know, see who uh, was really interested and then say, no, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll meet you all when I, when I get back. Um, however, Leeds wouldn't agree to that. <laughs> they said, no, 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 you ain't going away. We want to see you now. And uh, I said, no, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to go away. Uh, they said, no, no, we want you up tomorrow. You get yourself up here and we want to talk to you tomorrow. And they were very determined. And uh, and I like that. You know, I like that. And I hadn't thought of, uh, of Leeds um, at the time. And then I thought, right, OK, let's go and talk to them and I can come away and think about it and, and go from there. Um, but as soon as I got to Ellen Road and, you know, with Fotherby, who could uh, sell Santa Arabs, that guy, he was <laughs> good old Bill Fotherby, he was wonderful. Uh, and then talking to Howard, and uh, it just made so much sense. But it was, I think, the determination that they wanted to sign me. You know, they really uh, wanted uh, me in their in their side. Um, the determination, I think, to get better and improve. There was a clear plan in place. And then when I look back at what Leeds had achieved in the prior two or three years, when Howard uh, Wilkinson was you know, appointed. You could see the plan you know, there and then. He got the right players uh, at the right time. He got some great experience with uh, also Gordon Strachan being the catalyst of that. Uh, then you know, improving the side, got, a, got them out the, uh, the old second division. Uh, and then once he got up in the first division, bought you know, better and better players. Obviously, you know, Alistair Lukic and, uh, and all that. You know, they, suddenly you've had some great home youngsters with, with bats and speedo. These experienced players are coming. Um, and of course, when they went up, they finished fourth. Uh, and then, of course, they came to me and uh, just laid out the next step. And I'm thinking, it's a mistake. <laughs> um, so I know how they can be. And here I am with, uh, with Howard Wilkinson, and he's explaining to me uh, their tactics, you know, what they want. They want me, they want another very quick, Striker, which you know, are talking to me about Rod Wallace. Uh, they need you know, more, better uh, backup goals from midfield, uh, which I already thought they had <laughs> the best midfield, but they wanted Steve Hodge. Uh, you know, so you put all that on a new Hodge really well, obviously, from England. You know, obviously, Rod was tearing it up, uh, scoring goals. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, this, this actually, uh, we might have a chance here, or we might. Uh, have a chance and that was the thing it's having a chance that's where at Chelsea I thought you know we'd shoot ourselves in the foot somehow some way 
at that, at that time, obviously it's very, very different uh, a few years later, but at that time, you know, we'd, they would find them a way to, to, to stumble. Uh, and I found that very, very frustrating. And here, everyone seemed to have a plan, a clear vision and uh, a way forward. Uh, a manager that really, really, you know, was determined to, uh, to get me, wouldn't take no for an answer. Fotherby, who just wouldn't let me out of his car until I signed. <laughs> it was just, all of it was, uh, yeah, I was sold. And that was it. I thought, right, yeah, let's get this done. This looks uh, wonderful. And, uh, yeah, decided to sign. Did you always get along with Howard Wilkinson? Mm. Um, yeah, I did. Um, as long as he did what he said, everything was fine. Um, <laughs> I think when you're improving... As a player, I think when you're doing well and winning, uh, when you can see uh, an atmosphere and a group of players and a strength of, of the, the group improve, improve, um, you can't but you know admire what a fantastic job you know he he did and was doing. So absolutely, um, you know I could always uh, see the reasons for why he did things. I think everyone is not going to agree to everything all the time, um, but it was always done in the right way. Um, and I, yeah, I thought it was fantastic, you know, yeah, absolutely. And, and you look back at uh, certain tactics, and as players, um, we get bored quickly. So doing set pieces for 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, to drive everyone mad. But I tell you what, God, that was such a learning curve and, and helped us, you know, when the pressure's on. Uh, just naturally doing the right thing at the right time and coping with the situation because it was drilled into us and, you know, he was behind all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, and then getting that blend of the right people, right characters uh, was down to Howard Wilkinson. So, absolutely, it was fantastic. The reason I asked that, Tony, is because obviously we know Don Revy's completely revered at Ellen Road and it was a, it was a, it was was an era, wasn't it, with, with, with Revy where, where it was very different. Um, but you don't really hear the name Howard Wilkinson mentioned as much at Ellen Road. Why, why do you think that is? Um, I think you look back at that late 60s, 70s side, I mean, they were incredible. You know, the numbers uh, were just amazing. And the things that they've won, um, and, and recently, you know, it's all been brought into more focus when, unfortunately, the passing of a, a fantastic and great and lovely Norman Hunter uh, and Trevor Cherry, I, I know those two guys well. Um, and just when you think they play, you know, Norman plays 700 games and something like that for Leeds. Paul Reedy, 700 games. You look at you know, the, the cup finals, the, the Leeds, and it was just an incredible moment in Leeds United history. And, you know, players like me afterwards got them to thank for, for putting Leeds right up there and on the map. And, and it was incredible. Now, with that comes the pressure. But um, if you think where Leeds were then in the second division, wallowing and struggling, then for Howard to do what he did as well was just you know phenomenal. And you look at the plan and you look how it was done. And the players that he brought in, a lot of players you would think, no, don't buy Vinny or don't buy this or, you know, yet he made it all work. And then, of course, you know, move them out at the right time to then go forward again. So, um, and yeah, I think he did a, an incredible job and... Um, it's rightly so that that great 60s and 70s and Don Revy are, you know, revered as much as they are. But um, yeah, the next one along that did uh, incredibly well was for me was certainly Howard and, uh, and our lot. So um, it's not easy. You know, these things don't come around, uh, as we know, as we found out for the last 15 years. We can't even get into the top division for goodness sake. So it's it's very very tough. And you know, and I, I look back as well. It's not only the managers; it's the owners uh, as well. You need the right type of people behind the scenes. And that's when I go back to the Chelsea bit in that, you know, you, everyone needs to, to be rowing in the same direction and, and it's not easy. And even when you do, there's some really good clubs and managers and teams and players out there that you've then got to beat. And so, um, yeah, when it all comes together, you've got to acknowledge it's pretty darn special. And uh, and Howard was absolutely you know, instrumental in that, taking them uh, leads a long, long way from where they were to, to where they ended up was... Uh, well, for me, a, a huge achievement. So, um, you know, rightly so, the, the, the 70s and the longevity and all that uh, is revered, absolutely. But you've got to put Howard up there as well. And you mentioned a player earlier on, um, Tony, there I'd, I'd like to touch on. What was um, what was Gary Speed like as a person? Oh, Speedo, wow. What a fantastic, fantastic lad he was. He was uh, a little bit younger than me. 
him and Bats were like the uh, the deadly duo. Those two, they were <laughs> they were they were brilliant. It was uh, great to see them uh, just enjoy life so much. They gave us you know, everyone else around them energy. It was brilliant. But Speedo, um, I was really fortunate because he played in front of me, and we we worked together on that pitch. And I could not have dreamt for anyone better. Uh, to play with, to, to, you know, work together. And there's little, there's little, you know, groups all around the pitch. Obviously the back four, it's important. Uh, you know, the midfield four is important, but then you imagine Sterling and Strachan getting that understanding on the right, you know, it was important for me on the left and mine was Speedo. And uh, I was lucky because <laughs> Speedo could do everything. He could do anything that he wanted. You know, he could, in the air, he it was incredible. He could leap like a salmon. He could volley with left or right. He could dribble. He could tackle. He could run all day. He, you know, he was just uh, wonderful. And, and above all, you know, all the, the talent you got, you have to apply it in the right way. And uh, he would listen, you know, and we'd always talk, uh, you know, and if I want, I'm shouting in instructions and, you know, bang, it's done. You know, there was never any moaning or arguing or, you know, he's not going to do it or whatever, you know, he always did it for the best of the side, you know, as I was, you know, trying to as well. But um, it was a dream, you know, to play with and such a, a lovely young lad who had an appetite to, to learn and get better. Uh, and he had a, a way about him that you know, he never realised actually how good he was. He was one heck of a player, but he always was trying to get better. And that's a wonderful level-headed attitude to have. I think I... I you know, that's the way I thought as well. We wanted to improve and listen. And that's what he was like. So to play with him was, was easy. My God, it was, it was easy. It was an absolute uh, blessing. And, um, and for then his career to go on uh, as it did was no surprise to me. Everywhere he went, he was absolutely loved. Uh, and, you know, he was um, a wonderful, wonderful talent in that uh, midfield four. I think the only uh, huge and great surprise to me, obviously, was... Uh, you know, what happened in the end to Gary, because um, if you told me at the time and gave me a list of all the players that I'd played with, you know, who do you think would most likely to, to come across that situation, Speedo would be at the opposite end, because he just seemed um, such a level-headed and well-rounded guy. And I think, obviously, now we understand about mental health and, and Things so much more, uh, and football is the worst environment, you know, for that. In that we're all big macho guys and hiding everything. But um, um, I got to say, uh, Speedo was a, a wonderful guy on and off the pitch, and I, I, I never come across better. Simple as that. Yeah, some lovely words there, Tony. Um, going from someone who uh, was completely loved by Leeds United fans, probably to someone who was for a brief period, but Eric Cantona. Um, he, he wasn't at Leeds for very long um, I guess what I wanted to ask you was I mean how good was he and, and, and I guess maybe something not many people have asked you Tony how did it unfold for him at Leeds United I mean what were the players thoughts on, on you know when he was leaving and getting that sort of lucrative move to Alex Ferguson's Manchester United uh, it's interesting I talked to one or two of them uh, since all that happened um, and we have Similar, similar views, but um, I think for me it was a case of, unfortunately, it was the wrong club for him, you know, at the wrong, the wrong time. Uh, I think Eric was certainly a player that wanted uh, an arm around his shoulder. He wanted to be made feel important. He wanted to be uh, the focus of the team, and everyone would then play off him. Now, Wilco had no one like that. Wilco's teams weren't like that. You know, it doesn't matter who you were. You could be strapping, you could be Newsom coming in. You were all expected to do exactly the same uh, sort of job. No one you know, got away with anything. Uh, for me, that was the beauty of our side. We all worked 110% for each other. Uh, it doesn't matter who you were. Uh, whereas Eric, um, he was French. He played differently. Uh, but what a player. I come across Eric when I played for under-21s, England, under-21s against France, under-21s at Highbury. I think he drew 2-2 or something like that. He scored both. And he was a moaning, sulky, sod up top who just played and kicked some spurts and scored two. and was brilliant. Uh, then, of course, we know that all the issues after that. Uh, but when he came to Leeds, 
Um, I remember him scoring this goal in training. He scored this goal where it was a full-size pitch, but the goals then were brought up onto the 18-yard lines. So it was a wide but a shortened version. I think it was 8v8. And um, I think John Lukic threw it out over arm to the right-hand side on about the halfway line. And it was high up in the air, and it's dropping over Eric's right shoulder. So he's running down into the channel. It just gets over the halfway line, dropping over his right shoulder. And in one movement, Eric has volleyed it first time straight into the far corner of the goal and scored. The keeper, I can't remember who it was in the other, other goal, didn't even think he was going to shoot, didn't even move, and it just stood there. And we all stood there. And the thing went in like a 40-yard volley straight into the top corner. Now, if I'd scored that in training, you run around like a lunatic, <laughs> you go crazy. Eric just jogged back to the halfway line as if, okay, I've scored, we've got to kick off again. I'm thinking, okay, mate, you must be something a bit weird here because, you know, everyone else, we just looked at each other thinking, <laughs> okay, the, the guy's got a bit of talent, you know, absolutely. Um, but talent is one thing. It's then, you know, putting it into that team situation. But uh, I've I got to say, when in my personal uh, view and memories, uh, Eric was, was spot on, you know, when he was at Leeds. Uh, he trained well. He was a very, very good trainer. Uh, would uh, keep himself to himself a lot of the time. His English wasn't very good. Uh, it did improve. It got better and better until he got left out at the side. And then suddenly it disappeared. The knowledge of English just suddenly up and left. Uh, and that was Eric because he could, you know, he could just go sulky and fall out. But uh, for me, I, I could see all along that he needed to be treated slightly differently. Um, and, and that's where I think Wilco, uh, yeah, his ways weren't like that. Uh, and that's where I think there was a clash. For me, that, that's where the clash was. Uh, during our, our championship obviously winning year, uh, he came on at times and gave us something extra, you know, like a sub should. You know, Hodgie came on and, and scored. You know, Eric came on and, and did uh, a couple of bits, which, which um, helped, as you know, a lot of players did. So um, I thought it was um, a good move by the club to get you know, a, another body like that in. To do uh, things that uh, no one else could, but um, I was surprised, absolutely surprised that he got sold. You know, it, was a, it was a complete shock because um, I, I get it that you know he wasn't going to be exactly um, the the right type, but you know what? I was happy, and I think the players understood that we could have okay ran, done that a little bit more. And if he only wanted to do ninety five percent, as long as he did it in the right areas and scored. You know, at the right time, those incredible goals. Uh, then you know what? As a team, as a group, we maybe could we be better or not? You know, and clearly the boss thought that we couldn't, and that, that sort of influence, uh, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't the right thing. Um, then I didn't think that was the case, uh, and obviously he went on, uh, but no one would expect him to go on and do what he did. But of course, in Sir Alex Ferguson, he had someone that uh, made him the Pied Piper. You know, he was. The main man up top, the collar could go up, he could stand there and, and everyone else would then run around him. But of course, they had some great young players running around him. Uh, I understand that, but I just think the circumstances there uh, fitted him to a T that, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, in my head we could have made, uh, made more of him at uh, Leeds, absolutely. And obviously, you were just talking there, Tony, about having a, you know, a winning team and having the right components to sort of make that unit successful. What makes a winning team? Oh, what makes a winning team? That's a, that is a, a difficult one. I think you, uh, all, all pieces of jigsaw need to be there. You need a bit of luck. Uh, you need to be mentally very strong. You need to be extremely fit. Uh, and, and then you need to keep calm at the right moments. And, you know, and also... I think stay in the moment. And that was what I think Wilco was really good at doing. You know, it, it wasn't a case of kind of understanding, oh my God, we're going to, we could achieve something incredible here. You know, this is just, you don't want to get that overwhelming feeling. You know, it's bringing you back to doing the basics really well, you know, doing what you have been doing fantastically well, you know, even better. And you know what? Do lots of really good things right and, and good things happen. So, you know, don't look like, God, we could win the title. We could be 
the champions, you know, we've got 10 games to go and my God, and you know, what will that mean? And you know, that doesn't win you anything. What wins you is back on the training ground, working hard, improving, you know, getting fit, the recovery. But more than anything else, it's a sense, I think, of uh, the group coming together and feeling strong and, and, and powering on. And I, I talk about the group and I mean uh, the club, the manager, the players and the fans. You know, we all came together and uh, then it was like uh, an immovable force. And I felt that none more so than at home, Ellen Road. My God, we didn't get beaten, unbeaten. No one could beat us. I'm even talking about it now. And I'm thinking if I stepped out now, they still wouldn't beat us because you end up getting this mental strength. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from from all of those components I, I just said. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's very, very special and uh, difficult to do again, replicate, you know, and, um, and you try and try and try and try. And if you can replicate that, incredible but there might be one or two or three other teams that are replicating it as well so you know it's so much has to 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 work but i think when it when you're in the middle of that and it works uh, it feels you know very very special but um yeah quite a few things go into it and after the championship winning season uh, i guess i'm going to put it completely bluntly tony um you i guess you would expect maybe Leeds to follow that up potentially with a couple of championships was that a case of other teams like Manchester United getting stronger? Was it a case of maybe things not clicking for the for the for the seasons afterwards at Leeds United? Yeah, it's a huge disappointment. You know, no other way of saying it. Um, it was lovely to to try and uh, build on what we had, um, but the reasons why it's difficult. When I talk about uh, Ellen Road and that strength that we had as the season progressed and that mindset of suddenly you know, not being able to be beaten. And after the championship winning season, uh, I guess I'm going to put it completely bluntly, Tony, um, you, I guess you would expect maybe Leeds to follow that up potentially with a couple of championships. Was that a case of other teams like Manchester United getting stronger? Was it a case of maybe things not clicking for the, for the, for the seasons afterwards at Leeds United? Yeah, it's a huge disappointment. You know, uh, no other way of saying it. Um, it was lovely to, to try and uh, build on what we had, um, but the reasons why it's difficult. When I talk about uh, Ellen Road and that strength that we had as the season progressed, and that mindset of suddenly you know not being able to be beaten flip that away from home the following season and our, our mindset just drained the other way and you know it was so difficult it, it really was our home form uh, was still good and it needed to be to to make sure we were you know staying in the same, in the same division but away from home it was difficult um the biggest reason i don't know there are lots of little reasons i certainly think the uh the new back pass rules uh were uh a little bit part to do with that, of course, when we won, you could pass it back to the keeper and off you went. Uh, then suddenly you had to, uh, you know, keep playing like the rules now. So that was something that we didn't cope with very well. Um, yeah, maybe obviously you look at the, the signings. There's lots of things you, you could you could do and um, and look back on, but we found it very very difficult. Yeah. So uh, as 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 good as it was the previous year, we then you know felt the other side of it, uh, and that was yeah a big disappointment. And you obviously, your time at Leeds was, you had, you had a long career at Leeds, but um, you then moved to Torino um, in Italy. Now, obviously, I can imagine that was a, a massive excitement in your career, moving over to Italy for the, for the first time, really. I mean, I mean, can you just give us a little bit of, uh, of experience into that? Yeah, it was. It, it was fantastic. I was um, 31, 32, um, six years, excuse me, six years at Leeds United. Uh, I wanted to stay. Uh, George Graham uh, came in and I had one or two niggling injuries in my hamstring which were driving me mad um, and he came and said yes we want you to stay uh, but unfortunately you're going to have to take something like a 50% pay cut and uh, I don't know about you but uh, that didn't seem so attractive to me at the time uh, and uh, you know I would love to have played out the rest of my years um, but it didn't work out that way uh, and then I had Middlesbrough offering me two and three times what I was getting at Leeds. It was just crazy. So uh, 
that was where I thought I was going to go. And I was just waiting and waiting. Brian Robson was the manager then. I could have stayed and still based myself living in Leeds, which I absolutely loved. Um, and, and just, you know, drive up the road. Um, anyway, I think they were getting, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was Ravinelli or someone at the time. I said, no, we need to get that big sign in and the next one is going to be you. You know, well, come on, let's get it done. Let's go. And uh, it just never come. And suddenly, uh, Graeme Souness rang me, um, who was trying to get me when I was at Chelsea with the Glasgow Rangers. And he said, uh, Tony, I've just uh, become manager at uh, Torino. Um, my sporting director has bought me 15 new players. Uh, um, I've just looked at them all and none of them have a left foot. So uh, I need someone to play on the left-hand side. He says, do you fancy Italy? Do you fancy giving it a go? And I thought, you know what? Let's go for it. Let's absolutely go for it. So um, it, was, it was great. So it, again, I went out there just to talk initially and uh, got sold on it. And uh, they wouldn't let me back either. They said, no, no, you're going straight into a hotel and you are training the next day. I said, no, no, I've got to go back and get my stuff. They said, no, you're not. We need you to go back in training. So uh, it was brilliant. And, and Italy, for me, um, well, it was thoroughly enjoyable. It's a very uh, technical league. Um, I think sometimes the, uh, the physicality uh, or fitness levels, not physicality, because in England it's very physical, but the fitness levels to play in Italy is huge. Uh, and I learned so much in that, uh, my, my time there. Uh, I absolutely loved it. You know, it was, it was wonderful. Again, I was player of the year that year as well for Torino. So things didn't go bad. Uh, and I absolutely, uh, enjoyed it. I picked up Italian uh, pretty quickly as my father's Italian, but I never spoke it before. Uh, so I, I, I picked it up, uh, pretty quickly. All the swear words first, obviously that was always good. Uh, and then of course all the football terms and then, you know, away you go. But, um, it was quite funny. I remember, never ever forget, there was a, a story in the sun that, that, uh, that appeared. And once the story um, came out, I actually got a call the, the previous day uh, from a, a reporter from the sun. Uh, and he said, right, we're doing a story tomorrow. Um, obviously, it's about the, uh, the really bad time you're having uh, in Italy. And you want to come back to England. And obviously, Gordon Strachan's manager at Southampton now. And, and they, want to, they want to sign you. So, uh, you know, can you just tell me about um, your thoughts and, uh, you know, why you want to leave Italy so early? <laughs> I said, listen, mate, I'm in the middle of Turin. I'm in the piazza. It's six o'clock in the evening. It's 27 degrees. I'm sipping a bit of Prosecco. My risotto with Parmigiana is about to come out. I'm then going to have a nice bit of fish, I think, and then maybe, a, I don't know, a zabaglione from a dessert. Then I'm going to go back, and the next day, you know, we're going to go head off to Tuscany. And are you crazy? I'm absolutely loving this bloody place. So piss off, write the story, whatever you want. I couldn't give a damn. Anyway, next they wrote the story. It was stupid, and uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. They are crazy. It was a great experience, a learning curve. Even at 32, you know, I learned so much. Uh, soon as got sacked after six weeks, that was great. And then. Uh, <laughs> uh, he left me there. He went to Benfica. And then he said, right, will you come to Benfica? I said, for God's sake, I've just got to Italy. I've just settled in here. And now you go to Portugal. I said, no, mate, I'm staying in Italy. No, I love it. And, uh, yeah, I had a great time there. So um, I would have liked to have gone kind of earlier in my career because I think technically the Italian game would have suited me, you know, down to the ground. Um, but I was just, you know, delighted with the experience and um, enjoyed it very much. So, and then you came back to England, sort of finished with Derby, Stoke. Uh, obviously, the, the twilight of your, of your career. When, when is it you know, as a footballer, um, you know, your career is, is, is coming to a close? And, and how do you prepare for that mentally? Yeah, I think um, then when I came back, there was a falling out with the Italians because they wouldn't pay me the money they owed me. Another long story. Uh, but Derby came in... Um, and I've got to say, well, I was a 30, 32, 33 then. It was great. You know, good old Jim Smith, the archetypal Neanderthal type manager. Alongside him, um, Steve McLaren, sorry, Steve, I apologize for that. Um, Steve was fantastic. And he is the best coach of I've ever come across. Oh, he is. He is, I had two years joy with him. And I'm running around like a spring chicken. I love training. Uh, the club itself was a very friendly, happy club. And we finished, I think, seventh or eighth in the Premier League. It's the best they've finished for years. You know, we had a really good side. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. It was uh, really good. Again, my hamstring was always there playing up every now and then. But I was, you know, 
playing more than I wasn't, and it was uh, it was really good. Um, then I wanted one more year uh, to get the 35, really, um, and they couldn't quite give me what I uh, wanted. So I thought, right, I need one more year somewhere. I lived in Cheshire. I didn't want to move, and um, I was going to go to Wolves. Uh, they offered me X amount. As I'm driving down to Wolves, <laughs> their, uh, their chief exec rings and offers me half that amount. Again, what is it with this half stuff? I don't understand it. Again, I told him we could shove that where the, uh, the sun don't shine. And, uh, and as I turned back, uh, Stoke City rang. And um, that was actually only half an hour away from where I, I lived up in Cheshire. So, um, and they were beside themselves, said, please, 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 can you come? And all this sort of stuff. And uh, I didn't really want to drop down. It was a couple of divisions. But you know what? They were so um, you know, authentic people. Uh, old John Rudge. Rudgey was great. You know, they made me captain and they could look after and, yeah, and all this sort of stuff. So I thought, yeah, let's let's try and achieve something with, with, with Stoke and the uh, you know, new stadium and everything. It was, was great. Uh, so that's where I went. But as the season progressed, it, I found it difficult. Yeah, there's no no getting away from it. I found it mentally challenging. And there I was, you know, 35 years of age. Uh, the manager was uh, uh, Gudjan Tordason, the uh, Icelandic guy. Uh, he was, was great as well. Um, and he would say, right, you know, just playing the important games and when you want you to, when your body isn't feeling quite right and this, that and the other. And uh, never forget, a mate of mine was uh, having a surprise uh, birthday in uh, Moujon, in the uh, hills of, uh, of southern France, uh, overlooking the Med uh, for his wife, a 30th birthday, a surprise birthday. And he said, Tony, you know, do you want to come? Uh, we fly out on a Thursday night. You know, we'll put you up in a hotel. It's going to be a surprise party on the Friday night overlooking the, the med. And uh, I'll sort it all out. You know, it's going to be incredible. My friend's family would really love you to be there. I said, are you kidding? I've, I've got, I don't know, Colchester away on Saturday or something or other, um, which didn't, didn't fill me with a great lot of appetite, I have to say. And that's when I thought, oh, this, this, isn't, this isn't right. Of course, the manager comes to me and says, right, you know, what do you think about this weekend's game? Uh, you know, you, would you be okay to, because we really want you to play, can you play in this one? And I've gone, no, uh, I don't think I'm playing this one. He said, okay, you know, I understood, because we've got bigger ones in the following week, so uh, just come in and train Friday and have the weekend off. I said, no, I can't train Friday either, I, I want Friday off as well. He said, uh, okay, no problems at all, you know, so they, they were wonderful with me, you know, so I headed off on Thursday night, south of France, had a wonderful time. I get back, and um, I can't remember the score, and there I am on the Monday morning uh, getting interviewed for the captain's column for the for the uh, the next program, and I didn't have a clue uh, what happened and who played what, and uh, and that's when I thought you've got to stop this, you know, you got because I, I couldn't work out a way of getting through. And to be honest, that that was uh, Nigel Pearson was there as well. Nigel Pearson was the coach there, so I talked to Nigel about it all. Um, he was great, and um, I decided there and then that everything is telling me, you know, now is the the time to stop. And once I made that decision, it was easier to get through, you know, the rest of the games and what have you. But uh, I, I found the stopping uh, easier because my body was telling me that was it. That absolute appetite there was was not there. And um, I wasn't playing to the level that I wanted to. So it was, um, for me, um, difficult, but the right thing to do. I put my boots in the bin and uh, never put boots on again. Uh, and that was it when I left, 35 and a half. Uh, and I left happy, very, very happy indeed. Then what? Then I went straight to ITV. Um, I went into TV, basically. I got a three-year full-time, well, four-day-a-week TV contract. Um, and the media, I got offered one or two coaching roles, assistant manager. Um, I had my UEFA B license. Never quite felt... 100% if it's for me or not at that time. But I love the media side of things. So, um, And then when I looked at what someone was offering me at a, a lower club to be a coach, and I looked at what I was going to get for four days, I thought, ha, I think I know which one to go for here. <laughs> so I've cracked it here. Uh, yeah, and, and really that was why. But again, you need to do what you love. I don't care what, you, what uh, money you get. And I, I mean that in the... In the right sense I want enjoyment from what I do and uh, you know that would give me a load of enjoyment so um, that's why I went into that um, and then it was like digital after a year they went bust 
<laughs> which wasn't great. Um, but yeah, then stayed into the, the medium to always did uh, comms and punditry and what have you, which is uh, you know, exactly what I'm doing now. So it's lasted uh, quite a long time. So now I can just talk about football. And I'm still involved in it. But the difference is I can, uh, I can just go home and switch off and uh, get excited for the next game rather than anyone wanting to sack me. So, uh, which is quite nice. I was going to say, Tony, is that is that the the sort of difference with you can analyse football, you can talk about football, you, obviously it's your passion, but there's no sort of repercussions in that pressurised environment of maybe not getting the right result at the weekend and being sacked. Was that the reason you sort of wanted to go into media instead of the, the coaching side of it? Uh, yeah, I suppose, um, because I think you're then relying on so many other factors, you know, going, and uh, I, I did get offered a, a lower league, but you're looking at the circumstances and, you know, have you got... Uh, the right things to be successful. You know, I've been successful, but I've been successful higher up. And going down, that's so a new environment. So there's so many things to you know, consider and think of. Uh, and you look at some of the players, internationals that went to lower league clubs, uh, you know, that, that didn't work because they don't, that's not the football that they know. So it's a whole new learning curve. I think the right way to do it uh, now would be to go into a, a championship or a Premier League uh, club as a, as a younger coach, you know, move up, be the assistant, and then because that's where uh, I think um, certainly uh, a player that's played for their country, you know, has all the experience that he can then draw on. So there are, there are lots of things. So it never quite um, fitted correctly, and the, the TV was something that I always did anyway. I always was doing you know my media stuff, uh, and I also I like business, the, the business side of things. So I started one or two businesses. So for me. Um, it wasn't the be all and end all. Football isn't everything. You know, there's so many other things uh, in life. When I'm out on that pitch, it is absolutely everything, and I'll give everything to to do the best that I can. But you know, you have you have family, you have things to do, there's places to see, uh, there's lots of other experiences as well. So uh, that's how I kind of saw it. There's some some that don't know anything else. I, I do know other things, and uh, I enjoy them. So uh, yeah, I went the uh, the, the easier route, but um, I think I was going to say at least I didn't lose my hair, but actually that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. shaved, Tony. It's just shaved. <laughs> exactly, but I'm still smiling. That's the thing. You see, that's why. That's why I think. Uh, yeah, do what you love rather, uh, and do it for the right reasons, and you'll always, you'll always be good. And um, yeah, I, I, I want to touch on on Leeds just in a second. The the, the current sort of scenario we're in, but. I wanted to ask you as well, Tony. I think we've, we might have cleared it up, but who is the best manager and the best player you, you, you've ever been, been with? I think um, when you're talking about players, obviously it's Gaza. You know, that is uh, it was just uh, amazing. If you look at uh, the Leeds players, I think we had so many uh, great Leeds players and uh, you know, it's hard to choose one. I think if you're looking for uh, a player that's, that's turned things around with the greatest influence has to be Strack, you know, Obviously, the things what he did was incredible, but to, to pick, you know, a player from Strack, McAllister, Batty, Speed, you know, that's unfair, you know. And then, and, and same thing for, for, for Mel and same for Huggy Bear, Chris White, Chris Fairclough, you know, and, uh, and Rod and, and Lee up front. I mean, you know, because without the blend of all of that, they wouldn't as be as good as they are. And that's what we all understood, that we, we needed everyone uh, everyone else to, to play that well, and uh, but yeah, uh, I think as an individual, he, he was just amazing. Um, manager, um, I, I take a lot from a lot of different managers, but they are a different styles. Uh, and Howard certainly uh, had a certain style. He actually had a great sense of humour. Just a shame it was buried very, very deeply inside. <laughs> of him, so that's the thing, which uh, every now and then it, it, it came out. Uh, and when you did get to know him, he was great. You know, he's a uh, a great guy. But uh, obviously, he had to be the manager. He had to um, you know work in a, in a certain way. Uh, coach, best coach. I think we've got to touch on that. Uh, Steve McLaren uh, as a coach. Uh, he was uh, for me uh, certainly second to none. Um, so then you look at the other great manager like Bobby Robson. Um, it was an aura. It was an aura. You know, it wasn't his coaching. Uh, obviously, he had huge experience. You know, Don Howe did a lot of the, the coaching. Uh, but just the way that he could sympathise with a player uh, and and give you confidence and back you and uh, you had this feeling with him that uh, you know was, was really special. So um, all very different in in their way, but some, some great people nonetheless. 
and different managers obviously there's 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 none more different in the English game than uh, Marcelo Bielsa um obviously you're doing a lot of work with with Leeds now as well Tony so what is the feel around the place at the minute what is the do you see we're talking about the blueprint for success earlier on do you see that in this 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 current crop of players and, and this current crop of backroom staff uh, very much so, very, very much so. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be back at Leeds a lot more these days. Um, I really enjoy uh, yeah, working with the club. I uh, went with uh, with the boys down to Australia in the pre-season uh, tour as well. I so got a bit closer and, and saw things at, at first hand. Um, and it's an absolute joy to finally see in front of my eyes uh, a club develop back to having an identity you know I, I know now what the club is I, I know what the manager the boys are trying to do uh, you can see every single one rowing in the same direction and if you're not you're, you're out of there um, so I, I think it's brilliant I think it's absolutely wonderful it's been a, uh, a pleasure you know last season uh, and this uh, this so you know even more and you, you've got to say that um, I, I go back to the necessary parts to be successful and in my time you know it started back with the owner Leslie Silver you know to to give and have the foresight to have the right people in charge you know give them the uh, the right tools you know whether it's financial whatever it is and uh, now you know, Andrea um, has come in um, and we've had in the past so many decades and years you know the owners um you know, it haven't been right. It's as simple as that. You know, they, they haven't done a great job with, with what is uh, a treasure, and they haven't done that. And Andre has come in um, with the right uh, thoughts in his heart to do the right thing, and then he's tried and tried and tried, and uh, and you know to, to put uh, faith obviously in people around him and to get Marcelo Bielsa, uh, which was uh, you know wonderful, and then of course still financially to, to back him um, was a huge thing. So what what they've done. Uh, it's tremendous. The execs down there, you know, need a lot of uh, credit, and it's still it's difficult getting out of the championship. My goodness, it's difficult. But I tell you what, I now go down to Ellen Road on a Saturday with uh, with hope uh, and belief because I can see it all coming together, and I can see uh, a group of players, such such a group that are galvanised. They've improved. There's certain players that uh, improved immeasurably. You know. When I was coming two, three, four, three, three, four, five years ago, I'm looking at some of them, and I'm thinking, hmm, I'm not sure about him. I'm, I'm not sure about him. I'm not, you know, we're all saying the same things, and then, you know, the, the team's a bit disjointed, and you think, well, what, what exactly is going on? Where are we going here? But uh, I can see clearly now with Marcelo, and, and what he's done with certain players, turning around and, and improving everyone. That's what a manager does. That's what a manager does. It's not whether he gets given 50, 60 million uh, and then, you know, buys a player at the top of his game uh, to fit in and if it doesn't work, I oh, will not to worry. You know, Marcelo didn't do that. He came in and he said, right, I know what I've got, I know what type of player I need and I'm going to improve that, that, that and that player and that for me is, is incredible. What, what, I, what I find amazing is that, that the style of the football, you look at the style and I mean, I'm more used to that. Obviously, I've played in Italy. I've seen various styles and played in them. But this is the championship, and we are knocking it around from the back, you know, and pinging it from the goalkeeper and what have you. And there's no doubt. I I, I talk to and look at people at, uh, at Ellen Road, and they're having kittens. They're wetting themselves, you know, <laughs> when, we're, when we're passing out. But I tell you what, when it comes off, and then suddenly, not when it comes off, it's always coming off. Now we have the confidence to do that. We've grown. And the players have bought into it. And I look at how hard they're working and how fit they, they've got. And that reminds me a lot of my time. Because, you know, what? when you're winning, when you're improving, you'll listen to your manager and the people around you forever and a day if you're smart. If you're smart and you understand what's going on, you know that, uh, wow, this could be you know incredible time in your career. And uh, that's what I felt. And that's what I think these boys are feeling now in, uh, and in Marcelo, he is quirky. He is different. He is unique. He is some man. But uh, I tell you what, if I was a player now, whatever he'd be saying, I'd be doing it. You know, and uh, it's great. And the players are loving it, enjoying it. And I've no doubt, uh, if and when we get back and restart, we will hit the ground running. 
we will be exploding out the blocks. Why do you Why do you think that, Tony? Just out of interest. Because uh, there's be a strength of character and mind now. I, I can see a strong mind in this team. But for me, the the big question mark this season uh, was actually ourselves. You know, our, our our opponents. I'm looking at all the teams. I've seen everyone play. We played against everyone. You know, who's our biggest danger? Who's our biggest opponent? It's not a team. It's us. I, I, I firmly believe that it's not a team. It's us and our mental ability to, to cope and see it through. Because we have the tools. We are good enough. We have all the components. So, yes, you need a bit of luck. I get all that. But it, it's more us. I don't see anyone that's over a course of seasons better than us. But then you've got to experience those times when things go wrong. And it always will. You know, that, that's the way it is. You've got to limit those. Uh, and then come back, you know, bouncing and fighting. And, and that's where uh, the unknown is. Because let's be honest, last season we didn't deal with that very well. You know, you look at the last five, six games and what have you, you know, we didn't cope uh, well at all with, with uh, a couple of setbacks in it. It seemed to drain from us. We had a bit of a flicker and then, you know, it went. So that's where the question marks start to be raised. But I looked at this season and I saw things differently. I, I looked at a team that were different. And I'm waiting, though, for when the, the hiccup's going to come. I, I was waiting and waiting, and, it, and it's bound to come. And it did. It came. Uh, then I looked at that Forest game, I think. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a bad one. You know, that you can say what you want about a lot of things, but that wasn't a great response to what was happening in the previous games. Uh, so now we've got a, a huge uh, test down at Brentford. Um, wow, we were fantastic at Brentford. That are just incredible, you know. Okay, we got the draw, didn't we? But we deserved the win, and then we just went from strength to strength. We won every game. We, we didn't concede, and, and I saw that. I thought, ah, oh, okay, these boys, they've got it. Yeah, two, three games like that. Then bang, and off they go again. So um, they will be itching to get back out there. They'll be itching for anyone that says there might be a question mark to ram it down their throat, because that's what I would be as a player. I can't wait to get out there and show them. Uh, they are training hard. Uh, I've talked to one or two uh, during lockdown. Um, I know what training they're doing. Wow, my goodness. They've had one day off a week, and that's it. Wow. They're active, and they're ready to rumble. And, uh, and even they say, no one's going to be training like us. No one's going to have done what us. And, and that gives you such a mental strength and a mental boost. So don't be surprised when you see players in white scorching the turf <laughs> because that would be going crazy to get out there and, and show how good they are and how fit they are and how feel and what they want and uh, yeah that's how I'll be feeling um, because I think they should be feeling confident like that that they've done all the right things they were playing the best football they are the best team you have to prove it that's not a, a flippant thing to say go out there and prove it but they'll want to prove it so um that's why I say that. And this podcast will be going out sort of next week, um, Tony, probably around this this time, actually. So we don't know what, what's going to have, uh, have come to the fore then. But would you be... I mean... I guess, I guess what I'm going to ask is uh, the last couple of weeks and the mentality side of it is a really interesting point you bring up because I've thought to myself, you know what? If it's based on points per game fantastic we get back up to the big time it's all we've wanted it's a huge time away from the Premier League etc etc but now I look at it a little bit differently I think to myself I don't I don't want to go up with an asterisk next to Leeds United's name I, I don't want to leave this division after the football we've played after the experience we've had over these past two years and go up with that well Leeds did it because of PPG do you do you sort of share that narrative uh, okay the, the first thing for me, the overriding uh, thought uh, is certainly um, health and lives. Uh, over, over, you know, so forget that. that. That is the most important thing in the world. Now, obviously, we're talking about that is then um, put to one side and taken care of. But football-wise, um, the, the perfect scenario would be exactly what you say, is to play out the games uh, for... The integrity of the league, I think it's vital. I think uh, for the fans to not have that experience would be an absolute travesty. I look at players and I know uh, what it did to me uh, and how I felt and how I grew 
And some of these boys may never feel that again. This is their time. This is their chance. And so they'll be itching to do it. And, you know, they, they should be uh, doing that. But then, <laughs> but then I look at it on the other side of things. And from a club's point of view, from a Leeds United point of view, what's the overriding thing for them? You know, getting in the Premier League. We've got to get back there. You know, so worst ways, if we, if we do points per game or whatever it is, and we go up, you know what? We go up. But if we're talking about the rosy, perfect world is where health is fine and taken care of and we're all safe, that's number one. And then we play out. God, yes, we will do every single thing to play uh, each and every game you know, as best we can. And so um, I would want that. I've been pushing for that right to the very, very nth degree. Uh, I know the, you know the club is, but you have to watch out for every single scenario. But um, yeah, I look at it from, from many different angles and uh, I'm thinking... Fans, you know, even even now, obviously now, I, I go to, when I go to Ellen Road, I have people come up to me and say, I was seven years old when you won the title and I was there for the Norwich home game when you ran around and, you know, I gave you a scarf and you know, my dad took me there and I, I was there and it, there are so many memories and, you know, they're talking to you, goes, do you remember Sheffield United when that happened and this happened and we, we didn't think we were going to... All that sort of thing, I went through it as a player, you know, they've gone through it as fans and that has galvanised them for their future, their kids, their, and then it goes on and on and on. And, and that's what, you know, the Leeds fans would miss out on. And we'd miss out on one heck of a party. You know, absolutely. We may be a social distancing party or whatever, but you know what? It's to, to live those moments are really what it's, what it's, uh, it's all about. Yeah. Second best, going up, PPG, whatever, wonderful, we deserve it, absolutely. But uh, there are so many things to consider, but uh, certainly fans and players, and uh, it would be such a travesty if we couldn't do that. It really would. And, uh, you know, let's say, touch wood, you know, we, we, we do get to, to, to the promised land. How does Bielsa's Leeds fare in the Premier League, Tony? Because, you know, you look at uh, that, that Norwich side from... From last season, uh, you know, who won it, and, and and wow! I mean, I thought when they came to Ellen Road last season, I thought they were they were very very good. Um, and you look at sort of their progress in the Premier League, playing sort of nice football, you know, playing out from the back, and they've really struggled. Do Leeds need to adapt when they go up to the Premier League? If they go up to the Premier League, yeah, that's uh, that's the fascination, isn't it? Uh, we're already getting ahead of ourselves, by the way. Yeah. Like, oh, that was an if. I, I put if there. That was like... <laughs> yeah. I'm trying not to do that, but okay. Let's let's go with what you're saying. Yeah. It's not what I'm saying, but it's what you're saying. Hypothetical scenario, Tony. Let's go with it. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we get up. And then how do we get on? And you're right. I'm fascinated with what the uh, what is going to happen, but I could almost guarantee uh, what Bielsa will do in that uh, there, there is only one way of playing. There, that style is what it is, whether it's home and away. And sometimes, in a way, that's his strength, you know, to, to, to keep playing like that. Um, what will it mean? It will mean we can then obviously introduce uh, better players, to, but if we're playing the same way, um, yeah, it, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. And can you imagine, you know, going up and playing that style at Old Trafford and Anfield and the Etihad and then knocking it around. You know, we had a taste, didn't we? Let's be honest, at Arsenal. Well, I thought that was... I don't know what you thought about that, Tony, but I thought that first half was, was unbelievable. It's scintillating, you know, and uh, I'm looking at it thinking, OK, I, I, I've got the wrong shirts on here. Well, who's playing who? <laughs> it was just... And it was wonderful. It gave me, me... I had a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm I did, yeah. I think we're, we're going to come back. We're going to be back where, we, where I believe... You know, we belong and um, it's got to earn the right. We, we understand all those sort of things. But I do think um, he will play the same way. Uh, will there be any concessions? That's going to be the fascinating thing. And that's where I'm not, not so sure. But I, I think um, it's the opportunity to then improve the squad. Uh, that would be interesting to see where and how that happens. But, you know, I, I don't envisage us suddenly uh, launching it into the channels 70 yards up you know we're going to be playing our stuff out from the back but we're going to be uh, doing it you know even better and uh, let's hope you know that is over the long term uh, going to be successful but you're right you know you look at the Norwich and what have you come up uh, Sheffield United play a certain way and they've been very successful so it's going to be fascinating to see you know an old tactical master like Bielsa go at it against all the uh, the big boys if and when big we if. Go- 
Well, not mine, I got carried away, sorry. <laughs> well, Tony, that's it. Well, thank you so much for joining us, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, where can people find you, Tony? You're more than welcome. Yes, you can find me. What am I on? I'm on Twitter. I think Tony DiRigo. Yeah, everything nice and simple, I think. Might be Instagram, Tony DiRigo 3. But anyway, whatever it is. But uh, I'll be down at Helen Road. As soon as things start again, I'll be down there. So anyone that comes across me, come and say hello. And uh, hopefully we've got some good times ahead. You know what? I think we've had some good times in the last year or two. Let's enjoy them. But uh, I've got a really good feeling about uh, what's happening going forward. 